reactions from last week? You've been thinking about it? Anything occurred to you as you went through an entire week? Thinking about your Seders already? <laughs> Actually, I am thinking about my Seder already, but that's because I think Talia and Sherry are coming in. So. Oh. Right? And Talia without her family. So it's just like oh. we're all Yes? read the text of Elijah word by word um, and discuss some of the metaphors and the leap motifs that are there. Leap motifs are recurring themes that are in there. And next week we're going to go deep into the Moses and Elijah thing. Uh, yeah. Other thoughts? Yeah. Yes, sir. The only question I had was, uh, I always heard that Jeremiah was, you know, a terrible statement. Uh, why is it called Elijah? You always heard the Jeremiah. I always heard that people said if somebody was always really critical, they called it a Jeremiah. Maybe after Jeremiah. You never heard that? I only heard that in Cleveland. That, was <laughs> that tells you something Cleveland right there. there. <laughs> if people were really critical, they called it a Jeremiah. Well, I can I can infer why. Um, Jeremiah was, uh, you know, a prophet. There were prophets of rage and prophets of consolation. Jeremiah was critical and raged, but there were many prophets that did that. Well, so that's why I thought, you know, Elijah also seemed pretty critical. Yeah, wait till you know. see. Right, definitely. <laughs> like his, his, the narratives are not that long. I'd like to read as much as the primary text as possible. I think it'd be kind of neat if you could get up from here and said, "Oh, I read most of Elijah, right, in the primary text." So should we just get to it then? Okay. <laughs> Um, so we begin on 1 Kings, <coughs> chapter 17. Mountains up there, so we know he's in the northern kingdom. 
I'm not going to so much, I didn't bring maps, so I'm not going to so much track his zigzagging all over the country, but there's a lot of um, signifies here of what where the geographical region is. So uh, it's, it's actually interesting to read Bible now that we can go back to Israel. A lot of the Middle Age commentators, like Rashi, the most famous one, mm -hmm. read Bible without ever having been to Israel. And so a lot of the geography, they get wrong. They don't understand the geography. And in Bible, oftentimes geography is theology. They're telling you where for a reason. So as you're going to see later when he says he was in Gilad, but he ran to Beersheba, we actually can do that run now. And we know the different topography, the different climate, the different, uh, the different uh, features of the northern as opposed to the southern. And we can infer, well, why would he go to Beersheba? But I'm getting ahead of myself. You know, what theological statement is in that? So it's important to notice the geography, OK? So here we are. We've got the Tishbite, who is an inhabitant of Gilad. And now we can date Elijah, because we know that he's talking to Ahab. And I also went over this a little bit last week in terms of the divided kingdoms, because we know from other sources Ahab is a real king. So um, again, just to tell you again, there are three ways if we know something is true. And that's going to be important here because a lot of the modern scholars struggle with the truth of this. There's a lot of miracles in here that just don't make any sense. The Christians love Elijah. They compare Elijah to Jesus all the time. Jewish biblical scholars that are rooted in history and historicity are very confused by Elijah because there's a lot of hocus pocus that's going on. But we can date it, and there are three ways we can see if it's true, meaning did it really happen. Am I going too fast? Am I going too fast? Oh, am I talking? Am, am I talking too fast? No. There are three ways we can we can tell if something really happened. I say this every time, but I'll keep saying it just because who remembers anything anymore? <laughs> Honest to God. <laughs> My brother, may his memory be for a blessing, used to go like this. <laughs> he used to go. Taking the stars out of the sky. Putting the stars <laughs> back in the sky. And some days I just think that's my mental state. Putting <laughs> <laughs> the sky. Putting the sky. He used to say to me, Karen, if you want to talk to people, you got to learn to talk English. Because I don't know what that you're saying. Putting the stars out of the sky. <laughs> <That's so funny. laughs> Um, <laughs> so uh, we can date this and the oh, so the three ways to know whether something is really uh, really happened are what does the biblical text say? What does extra biblical text say? In other words, did is there is there mention of a king Ahab in any other writings of all the countries and tribes that are going on at the same time? And the third way to know if something is true is to find archaeological evidence. And the best way is when the three of them combine. When what the Bible says cooperates with what we find in the ground, which makes sense from what we write, what other people write. But you know, the way other people write is very differently. We have a point of view. This is written not to tell you history. This is written to tell you theology. Although extra biblically, Ahab will be written to tell you politics. So the perspective is completely different. Completely different. For instance, I'll just give you a quick example. Um, we know that there was a siege around uh, Jerusalem. And uh, they woke up one day, uh, and all the army, the entire army, the Assyrian army, was killed, was dead on the ground. And the Bible says it was a miracle of God. And the Assyrians say, um, there were uh, rats, and people died of disease. So if you only read the Assyrians, you would have one point of view. If you only read the Bible, you would have another point of view. So they tell the same story, but they tell it from a different perspective. Does that make sense to you? Sure. All right. We're not going to get very far like that. <laughs> As the Lord lives, okay? So, Chai Adonai Elohei Yisrael. Chai. Adonai, Elohei, Yisrael. You actually understand every word there. 
Hai. Hai. Adonai. God. Elohe. God. Israel. Of Israel. Israel. I do feel like the little Scott. Wow. <laughs> so this is really emphatic in the Hebrew. Not so much in the English, but really emphatic in Hebrew. The God, the God lives. The God, the God of Israel lives. Okay, so the ruling force of the universe is this God. Whom I serve. And let's make no mistake about it, Ahab. I'm one of his. There will be no dew or rain except at my bidding. Who's bidding? God. Really? Except with Elijah's bidding. Wow. So here we have him acknowledging the supremacy of God and threatening with his own magical. And this whole idea of magic and mysticism and the magical powers of Elijah is going to keep coming back and forth. And what is he going to withhold? He's going to withhold dew and rain. Why dew and rain? Why dew and rain? Because either way, even if it's just dew, you can, you can be sustained by it. So what is he doing? He's saying, I, am in control, I Elijah, am in control of life here to Ahab. Well, the reader's reading this, and I'm saying, okay, so what exactly happens here? The word of God comes to Elijah. Leave this place. All right, so now he's starting to get on his magic carpet. And turn eastward and go into hiding, which is east of the Jordan. All right, so he's up here. Now he's going over here. I can see the outline of my map, but I'm sure you can't. No, we can't. We can't see it. It's moments like these in Ezra. Okay. He would freak out with this kind of map. But <laughs> <laughs> you get the point. <laughs> you will drink from the wadi, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you. Okay. What other questions? What's another question? We're going to answer that. Is he eating the ravens? Or are the ravens bringing him Ravens bringing him food. Why is he in hiding? Right. 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 Okay. So the first question is, why is he in hiding? Well, he just threatened Ahab. So the first thing that Ahab is going to do, and Ahab's God, who is Bob, so the first thing that Ahab is going to do is go get him. So here he's become the prophet of the Lord, of Adonai, saying, you're going to be in a drought, and his life is in danger. So he goes to the wadi and hides into a cave. But there's a problem with this cave. It's a cave. Now, it is by a river. Which river? It is by a river. So he will have water, as opposed to Ahab, who's not going to have water, right? But he won't have food. So God has instructed the birds to feed him. Well, the commentators don't like this at all. Birds? What are we, Mary Poppins all of a sudden? The birds are gonna the birds are gonna feed him. So, how do you spell Raven? R-A-V-E-N. Okay, you're fired. Ian. Look at it. Oh. Look, those of you who have the Hebrew, how do you spell raven? It is... Thank you. Ayin, Reish, Bet. Arav. In plural. Say it again. Erev. Erev. I thought you said something else. Nope. Arav. What are Arav? Plural. The plural. It is plural. Raven. So Rashi says, uh, don't read ravens. Read. Oh, wow. <laughs> Quite a difference. So already, they're from the very first lines. The rabbis, the commentators are saying, yeah, you know, I don't know. 
this kind of weird stuff going on here. Don't read ravens. Read people will come along of the locals and they will give them food. But it gets pretty explicit what's going to happen here. Hey, that's the meaning. Why was something translated to Raven in English? Because Raven is the right, right translation. The rabbis switch it and make an interpretation out of it. Uh, verse 5. He proceeded to do as God had bidden. He went out and he stayed in Wadi Cherit, which is east of the Jordan. And, lo and behold, the ravens brought him bread and meat every morning and every evening, and he drank from he is now sustained by the birds <coughs> of God's bidding. <clears throat> After some time, the water dried up because there was no rain in the land. So now we know that he's just not very impressed with himself, but there's, he actually has power. So there is no water in the land, and the water dried up, even the water that he was getting the water from. And the word of God came to him and said, Go at once to Zarephath of Sidon and stay there. All right. So he was here, he went here, and now he's going here. Wow. Sidon, that's in Syria. <laughs> we still have um, the city sign in Syria. Probably destroyed by now, but we still have it. I have designated a widow there to feed you. Okay, so he's got to eat. So now he goes out of his cave and he goes to Sidon and he's looking for a widow. So he went at once to Zarephath, and he came to the entrance of the town. He's in the entrance of the town, which, now remember, all towns are, are what does that mean, the entrance? So once you get the right visual, they're very good, they're all walled. So he's in the gate of the town, and from the gate of the town, he sees a widow. <clears throat> Gathering wood. How does Questions. He How does he know it's a widow? Beautiful. <laughs> Gathering wood, and he calls out to her, please bring me a little water in your pitcher and let me drink. Question. Where'd she get the water? Actually, other people who met women in desiring of water, who met the well. Yes, women by the well. What's another question? I love your class. Okay, so question number one is, what is it that signifies her as a widow? Question number two is, what is it that signifies her as the widow? <laughs> okay, so he says, bring me something to drink. And she went and fetched it. And he called out to her and he said, bring me a piece of bread. And then she says, as the Lord lives, Chai Adonai. Now, where did we find Chai Adonai? At the very beginning. So she's now using his language. The literature, the literary analysis here is, is extraordinary. It is not a mistake that at the beginning of the narrative it was Chai Adonai, and here it's Chai Adonai. As God lives, she replied, you're saying it's your God. Right. My God, but not hers. Not hers. Doesn't say, hi, Adonai. God is, yes, it says Adonai, not a God, the God. yud hey vav hey. So she's saying, it, it, you know, she's saying, it's kind of like a, an idiom at this point. She's saying, seriously? I don't have any bread. Right, in modern Hebrew. Chayach, by your life. I don't have any bread. Okay, read it that way. There's a tonality here. Right? So she says, as God lives, I have nothing baked, nothing but a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. I'm just gathering a couple of sticks so that I can go home and prepare it for me and my son. We shall eat it, and then we shall die. Why is she going to die? Not enough food. So she's saying, I, I, can't, I can't share this with you. I have just a little bit. I'm poor. I'm a widow. 
and it's enough for me and my son, and as it is, we're probably going to die. And he says, don't be afraid. Go and do as you have said. But first, make me a small cake from what you have here. So what's he testing her to do? You think you have just a little bit? Finish it up even before you go home to your child. First he wants bread, now he wants cake. I think it's a cake and it's the same. It's a kind of bread. Okay? So so he's saying, he's saying, you only have a little bit to feed your son and yourself, and as it is, you're going to die. Don't worry about it. Finish what you have and give it to me. Wow, right? Actually, he's saying he can first. Exactly. And bring it out to me and make some for yourself and your son. For thus the Lord of God of Israel, thus said the Lord of God of Israel. So now he's saying, just in case, let's just be clear, this high Adonai is Elohei Yisrael, the God of Israel. The jar of flour should not give out, and the jug of oil should not fail, until the day the Lord sends rain upon the ground. He's prophesizing, right? Mm -hmm. And she went and did what Elijah had spoken. Question? Why? Right. Why? So how these two are in dialogue, she is unnamed. She is a widow of a certain town. How does he know she's a widow? How does she know? How does he know that she's the widow? How does she know that he's a prophet? How does she know that this God is really going to supply her? This is very, you know, very small narrative. Yeah, John. It's almost like the story of uh, 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 the story of uh, Abraham was slaying his son because you're talking about putting somebody else before your own. So here she's putting Eliza ahead of herself and the child. Okay, there's definitely that um, that um, connection, and there's also the connection, I think, of Sarah, you know, making the cakes yeah. to the strangers. She went and did as Elijah had spoken, and she and he and her household had food for a long time. First miracle in this Bible the story. The flour and the oil did not give out. What does this in the Christian world remind you of? The loaves. The loaves of bread. That's what I'm saying. The Christians love Elijah. They're, they're thinking that he's a precursor to Jesus. It gets better. The jar of flour did not give out, nor did the jug of oil fail, just as the Lord had spoken through Elijah. After a while, Telling the story here. Coming along after a while. Be a hard Ha'eved. The son of the mistress of the house fell sick. And his illness grew worse until he had no breath left in him. So she says, My son is going to die. He says, No, he's not. She's right. Son dies. No breath left in him. Following me? Yeah. She said to Elijah, What harm have I done you, O man of God, that you should come here to recall my sin and cause the death of my son? What sin? Okay. We don't know, but the theology here is that life and death, remember the metaphor of water is life and death and sustenance. Life and death are given by God. So if life is taken away prematurely, it's as a result of some sin that you have done, which is the purpose of repentance. But she's confused. She says, you're a man of God. You told me you were a prophet. You gave me this miracle, which actually is a miracle. Why are you doing this to me? What have I done to you that you should have your God recall the sins that I have and therefore punish me by taking my son? Give me the boy, <clears throat> he said to her. And taking him from her arms, he carried him to the upper chamber of what? Of the house, one would think. But 
it should not be lost on you that it is the upper chamber, okay? Where he was staying, that's where he slept. And he laid him down on his own bed. So he took the dead boy from the arms of the mother, took him upstairs where he was sleeping, and laid him down on his own bed. Interesting detail that we have here. He cried out to God and said, O oh Lord my God, will you bring calamity upon this widow? whose guest I am, and let her son die. So just as she went to him and say, what have I ever done to you? <coughs> Elijah's going to God and saying, what am I, aren't I doing everything you told me to do? You told me to come here. You told me she would provide for me. What, why are you letting this child die? He's, he's yelling at God. Then he stretched out over the child three times. What does that look like? So one could guess that the, the child is lying here, and he's you know doing something like this, right? Three times, laying hands on the child, three times. And cried out to the Lord saying, O oh Lord my God, let this child's life return to his body. The Lord heard Elijah's plea. And the child's life returned to his body, and he was revived. Second miracle. He picked up the child and brought him down from the upper, chain, upper room into the main room, and he gave him to the mother. See, said Elijah, your son lives. The woman answered Elijah, now I know that you are a man of God, and the word of the Lord is truly in you. Elijah. Go back to Ahab. 
Then I will send rain upon the earth. Thereupon, Elijah set out to appear before Ahab. There was severe, the, the famine was severe in Samaria. Okay, so we still know where we are. We're here, the Samaritan Mountains. Samaria is the mountain range that's here. Oh, I'll get it here. I got it. Thanks. Oh, maybe I should. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Ahab summoned Obadiah, the steward of the palace. Obadiah, in parentheses, revealed God greatly. When Jezebel was killing off the prophets of the Lord, Obadiah had taken hundreds of prophets, hidden them, fifty to a cave, and provided them with food. So you remember, he, he, Ahab marries Jezebel, and Jezebel is just... What movies have you seen about Jezebel? Betty Davis. <laughs> <laughs> Betty Davis was Jezebel? Yeah, there was a movie called Bet Jezebel, mm -hmm. and she starred in it with Henry Fonda. With Henry Fonda? I think it was Henry Fonda. Mm -hmm. That I'll have to look. I wonder if I saw that. That's good. I must have, because I asked you the questions, because I asked you questions I actually didn't remember. Any other movie you've seen with Jezebel? Jezebel was a real character. She was apparently extremely beautiful and very violent, very ruthless. Ahab said to Obadiah, go through the land to all the springs of water and to all the wadis. Perhaps you shall find some grass to keep the horses and mules alive so that we are not left without beasts, because they're all dying from this famine. They divided the country between them to explore, Ahab going alone in one direction, Obadiah going alone in the other direction. Obadiah was on the road when Elijah suddenly confronted him. Obadiah recognized him. <coughs> Not sure how anyone's recognizing anyone here. It's an interesting leet motif, again, another theme that is appearing. And flung himself on his face, saying, Is that you, my lord Elijah? Yes, it is, I, he answered. Go tell your Lord, Elijah is here. But he said, what wrong have I done that you should hand your servant over to Ahab to be killed? And Obadiah is, is, um, is afraid of Ahab, and he's cooperating with him, but it's not, it's not pretty. So Elijah wants to use him as a messenger, and Obadiah says, you're going to get me killed, buddy. As the Lord lives, there is no nation or kingdom to which my Lord has not sent to look for you. And when they said he's not here, he made a kingdom or nation swear that you could not be found. In other words, we've been looking for you for three years. Now I'm going to tell him I found you. And now you say, go tell your Lord, Elijah is here. When I leave you, the spirit of the Lord will carry you off, and I don't know where. And when I come and tell Ahab and he does not find you, he'll kill me. So Obadiah is saying, I don't trust you, buddy. You've been all over the map here. We've been looking for you for three years. You're setting me up. I'm going to go back to Ahab, tell him that you're here. You're going to disappear again because this god of yours is going to whisk you off to some widow or some cave, and I'm going to be killed because I will have told, told the ruthless king Ahab a falsehood. Yet your servant has revealed the Lord from my youth. But Obadiah says, yet I'm one of you. I believe in God. I'm on your side. My Lord surely has to been told that I did when, what I did when Jezebel was killing the prophets of the Lord. He says, I can prove it. Jezebel was killing all the prophets, your people, Elijah, and I hid them, hundreds of prophets, 50 men to a cave, and provided them with food and drink. So he's providing them with food and drink. And just like the widow provided Elijah with food and drink, right? So there's a, there's a parallelism here. And Elijah says, go tell your Lord Elijah is here. Why he will kill, why he will kill me. Elijah replied, as the Lord of the host lives, whom I serve, I will appear before him this very day. Elijah says, don't worry about it. I'm, gonna, I'm not going anywhere. Okay, following the narrative, right? Mm -hmm. Obadiah went to find Ahab and informed him, and Abraham went to meet Elijah. When Ahab caught sight of Elijah, Ahab said to him, It is that you, is that you, you troubler of Israel? 
he retorted. It is not I who have brought trouble on Israel, but you and your father's house by forsaking the commandments of the Lord and going after the Baalim. So here's the first time that we know what Ahab's sin has been. Elijah is going to Ahab and saying, there will be no dew and no rain because you have organized all of the people to follow Baalim, which are other gods. The word Baal is an interesting word in modern Hebrew. Can you see in the Hebrew how you spell it? Okay, that's, that's. <coughs> Baal, bet ayin, lamed. lamed, Baal. So Baal means the master. The gods, the foreign guards here are called Baal. That's the name of the far, foreign god, it's called Baal. So the war, the war is really between Adonai, yod hey vav -Hey, and Baal. Now look what modern Hebrew did with the word Baal. When they had to say the man of the house, they called it Baal, Baal, Baal the Bite. Or Lambert. Who's, who's, the man, who's the man of the house? May I speak to, today we say may I speak to the head of the household. Because we've gotten some politically correct. But in modern Hebrew they haven't gotten there yet. They want to know the man of the house. They call him Baal Habayt. The man, the master of the house. After the God. Gets even better. You know how to say husband? Ish? Baal. Who is Baal Shem Tov? <coughs> Baal Shem Tov was the map. Ba Baal Shem Tov was a person who was um, um, uh, part of the Hasidic Revolution. His name means the master of the good name. Baal, master, Shem, Tov, of the good name. Husband is Baal. So when I say, let me introduce you to my husband, I say, let me introduce you to Baali, my master. <laughs> and not only my master, but my master that refers back to the ancient god, Baal. Really interesting, right? So there are many women in Israel, not a whole lot, but many women will say, not Baali, my master, but rather Ishi, my man. Ishi. Because a wife is called Isha. Isha what do you is say? woman. So it's Baal, the master of the Isha, the woman. So when he says, let me introduce you to my wife, he says, let me introduce you to Ishti, my woman. And she says, let me introduce you to my husband, Baali, my master. And in the language is, of course, all kinds of assumptions. So if we're going to keep Ishti, Isha, the opposite of Isha, woman, is Ish, man. Are you following this Hebrew yeah, lesson? Yeah. So some women are now saying, he's saying, let me introduce you to my wife, Ishti, and she's saying, let me introduce you to my husband, Ishi. Now, there's some precedent in this. Um, this is a real digression, but um, <laughs> it's an interesting one. Oh, interesting. Uh -huh. It's profound. It's 
used in private um, premarital counseling a lot. So can I ask? I mean, that's a whole conversation, right? What is the nature of your love? Is it just sexual? Is it just you're talking to twenty somethings or thirty somethings? Just sexual? Is just passion? Or is there a spiritual element to your love? And if there's no spiritual element to your love, it it's going to consume you. But if there's a spiritual element to your love, it's going to deepen over time. And those of us who've managed to stay married for a little bit <laughs> get that, right? Oh, someone had a hand up. Yeah. yeah. So when you introduce, this is personal, if you don't mind. When you introduce Ezra as your husband, what do you say? Ezra. <laughs> Good response. When I was living in Israel, I started taking the sheep. They don't even hear it. I gotta say that Israelis don't even hear what they're saying. It's just the word for husband. They don't. They're not saying master and woman. They don't hear it. Just like when we were saying all those times the Lord, we didn't know that we were using a masculine signifier for God. We didn't hear it. Or even sometimes we were saying the master of the house. Or mankind. When we used to say mankind, we didn't hear that we were excluding women. We heard it as mankind. Right? So there's a sensitivity to language. All right, let's get back to the story. 19. Now summon all Israel to join me at Mount Carmel. Together with 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So we're going to have a standoff. We are, um, the, wait a minute, lost my place. Here. We're in Mount Carmel. So now we're over here, Mount, the Carmel Mountains, near Haifa. Right? So we're up here. We're up here, probably. And Ahab's saying, okay, buddy, we're having a standoff. I'll meet you at OK Corral in 1200. That's exactly what it is. We're going to choose our weapons. And who's going to be there? My prophets, the prophets of Baal, Jezebel's prophets, prophets of Asherah, that's her God. Right? Because she, remember, gods are territorial in the pagan world. So they don't travel with you. One of the revolutions of monotheism was that this God, when you left the territory, this God went with you. So that whole Lech Lecha with Abraham, leave your home and go to the land that I will show you. He left Mesopotamia and went to Beersheba and God followed him. But most gods are gods of territories. So Baal is the God over here and Asherah is the Phoenician God up here. So when she came with her, when she came to marry him, she has her God that hangs out over here, and his God that hangs out over there. That's how there could be so many gods. And they war against one another. But this alliance between Jezebel and Ahab now, they're going to combine their two prophets of the two different gods. Following this? Against the one Elijah and his one God. So how many gods are they going to have? Hundreds. So Ahab sent orders to all the Israelites and gathered the prophets at Mount Carmel. Elijah approached all the people and said to the people, how long will you keep hopping between two opinions? This is a really interesting idiom that we're not quite sure what it means, but apparently it means something like he's saying to the Israelites, how long are you going to be wishy-washy here? One day you're following Adonai, one day you're following Baal, the reason why you're all in trouble is because there's one God and you cannot follow the other God. Idolatry is forbidden. Okay. If the Lord is God, follow him. And if Baal, follow him. Make up your mind. Are you with me or are you against me? But the people answered him, not a word. People say, oh, I'm not saying anything this guy. I heard he revived a kid. I don't know, something about birds. I'm not talking to him. Then Elijah said to the people, I am the only prophet of the Lord left. It's just me. The prophets of Baal are 450. Let two young bulls be given to us. Let them choose one bull, cut it up, 
and lay it upon the wool, bowl, wood, and let them not apply fire. I will prepare the other bowl and lay it upon the wood and will not apply fire. In other words, you think your God's a real God? Okay, let's go make a sacrifice to God. Here's one pile of wood. Cut up your bowl, put them on there, but no fire. Here's my bowl. I'll do the same. You're 400 and what is it, 50. I'm one. We're going to see who's going to sacrifice to God. Nobody's going to apply the fire. I'm not going to have the fire here. Got it? You will then invoke your God by name. And let us agree, the God who responds with fire, that one is God. So he's not going to have a standoff with the Baal prophets. He's going to have Baal and Adonai have their standoff by preparing a sacrifice. And what do the people say? <coughs> Tov. We agree. Tov HaDavar. We agree. Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Choose one bowl and prepare it first for you or the majority. You know, take it out as gun. You pick first. Which gun do you want? <laughs> Invoke your God by name, but apply no fire. They took the bowl that was given them. They prepared it. They evoked Baal by name from morning until noon, shouting, Oh, Baal, answer us. All day this is going on. But there was no sound. None who responded. So they performed a hopping dance about the altar that had been set up. So apparently there was some kind of dance. You know, think of the Cherokee. You know, there's some kind of dance that is going around. So they, the, the first thing they do to get the fire on the altar is to evoke God's name, Baal's name. Nothing happens. No sound. That's going to be important in a minute. Well, next week, not this week. No sound. Okay. Ain Kol. Remind me I told you that. Ain Kol. No sound. So they decided, okay, we, us calling out, which means praying isn't going to help, so let's start this dancing ritual. When noon came, Elijah mocked them, saying, Go ahead, shout louder. After all, he's a god. <laughs> he can't hear you folks. Make it louder. But he may be in conversation. Maybe he's detained. Maybe he's on a journey. Or maybe he's asleep and will wake up. He's laughing at them. So they shouted louder. And they gashed themselves with knives and spears. Now I want to pause here for a second. You may have noticed on television, and if you haven't, you must pay attention from now on, that there is an ecstatic dance among Muslims among extreme Muslims, in which they dress all in black, and in this dance, in expressing devotion to God, they take knives and they gash themselves oh. with knives. It's very bloody. It periodically appears on television when they're trying to rile up the forces um, in a terrorist activity against the people. You will notice that they're all bloody. And it comes from here. Okay? So this is an ancient sermon. So first they call out, that's not working. Then they dance, and that's not working. Now they're gashing themselves, which is another ritual. And according to their practice, in case you think that's weird, until the blood streamed over them. When noon passed, they kept raving until the hour of presenting the meal offering. So certain offerings have to be presented at certain times of day. So we've moved into the next sacrifice. Still there was no sound. Cold. No sound. And none who responded or heeded, heeded. Then Elijah said to all the people, Come closer to me. And all the people came closer to him. He repaired the damage of the altar of the Lord. He took 12 stones corresponding to the 12 tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come. Israel shall be your name. Jacob and Israel and sin. And with the sons, he built an altar in the name of Yudhibabhe, Adonai. Around the altar, he made a trench large enough for two seahs of seed. In other words, a big trench around the altar, right? So you've got this altar, you've got 12 boulders, and then around the boulders, you've got this huge trench. 
That's what it looks like. He laid out the wood, cut up the bowl, laid it on the wood. He said, fill four jars with water. What's the question? Why are you asking that question? Very good. Where's the water? So that's, a, that's a hidden miracle there. He says, he says, fill four jars with water and pour it over the burnt offering and the wood. And then he says, do it a second time. And they do the second time. Do it a third time. And they do the third time. And the water ran down around the altar. Even the trench was filled with water. Why is he drenching the altar with water? <laughs> Lest you think that this fire that is about to break out was uh, was a little magic trick that I performed. I'm not gonna. I'm not going to. Do, we are drenching this, and we are keeping the water in a pool around the altar. Do you believe you're reading this? Right? Like a fairy tale. I can't believe it's in my Bible. <laughs> I can't believe I'm singing about this dude all the time. <laughs> when it was time to present the meal offering, the prophet of Elijah came and said, Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Israel's Jacob, right? Let it be known today that you are God in Israel, and that I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your bidding. Answer me, O Lord, answer me that this people may know that you are our Lord, O oh God, for you have turned their hearts backwards. He offers this invocation, this prayer. Right? You can imagine me up in the, up in the Bema <laughs> offering this prayer, Cantor singing it, everyone saying, Amen, <laughs> right? Then fire from the Lord descended upon the consu and consumed the burnt offering. The wood, the stones, the earth licked up the water that was in the trench. They saw this, all the people flung their faces and cried out, The Lord alone is God! The Lord alone is God! Which we do say in our liturgy. Hu ha Elohim Adonai. Hu ha Elohim. Wow, huh? <clears throat> then Elijah says, Seize the prophets of all. Let not a single one of them get away. They seized them. Elijah took them down to Wadi Kishon. He's going south. And slaughtered them there. How many? 400. Elijah said to Ahab, Get up, eat, drink. For there is a rumbling of approaching rain. People have repented, so now the rain's going to come back. And Ahab went up to eat and drink. Elijah, meanwhile, climbed the top of Mount Carmel, he's in the north again, crouched on the ground, put his face between his knees, and he said to his servants, go up and look toward the sea. So he's up on the mountain. Mount Carmel overlooks the sea, by the way. This is actually real geography. He's crouched low like this. And he's saying to his servant, I, I, I can't wash. What's he looking for? Rain? So, rain. So in Israel, there's either rain or there's not. Not like this stuff that has going on here. You have a rainy season and you have a dry season, which is why you pray for dew in its season and pray, pray for rain in the season. And when you're in the summertime, and when there's a drought, you see the rain coming off the horizon. It's not like it is here. We say, oh, look at the clouds in the sky, because there are always clouds in the sky. You say, I wonder if it's going to rain today, or I wonder if it's going to snow today. In the summer, it's not going to rain. And in the winter, you look up at the sky to see if the cloud is coming. So Elijah now has done this big, magnificent thing, and he's wondering, is it going to happen? So where's the power? Is it in Elijah? Is it in God? Or is it in Elijah's faith in God? So he's like this, and he's saying to his servant, go, go watch over the horizon to see if you see any clouds coming. It's 
said to his servant, go up and look toward the sea. He went up and looked and reported, there's nothing. Seven times Elijah said, go back. And the seventh time the servant reported, a cloud as small as a man's hand is rising in the west. What a beautiful image, right? Can you just see that? You know, he's like looking and anticipating the end of this drought. And just over the west, which is over the Mediterranean Sea, he's on Mount Carmel, and the sea is over here, over the west. He's like, I am a, a cloud as small as a man's hand is starting to come over the sea, which is where the rains are going to come from. Then Elijah said, go say to Ahab, hitch up your chair. Go down before the rain stops you. Meanwhile, the sky grew black with clouds. There was wind and a heavy downpour. Ahab mounted his chariot and drove off to Jezreel. He's going down to a different valley. The hand of the Lord came upon Elijah. Elijah's touched by God. He tied up his skirts. That's kind of like put up his bootstraps. You know, because they're wearing, they're wearing um, robes. So he tied up his skirts and ran in front of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. So Ahab's on a chariot. Elijah is running in front of him all the way to the Jezreel Valley. Questions, thoughts? First of all, the thunder makes the sound. I mean, the God is there. It's hard to hold the Bible in one hand. <laughs> yeah. And, and the other thing that strikes me is he looked over the West and he saw a cloud the size of a hand. What does it remind you of? 
Moses with the Ten Commandments? Not, uh, not here, Moses. We're going to get to Moses, I promise. Oh. But the book? Not this one. <laughs> uh, not, it's reminding you of something, but it's not Noah. It's Jonah. Jonah. I'm sorry. Which is what you meant, both right. in the name, right? right, right. You remember the story of Jonah yes. that we tell on Yom Kippur? Jonah goes off after Jonah performs all these miracles, and after the people people repent, Jonah goes off and is under a bush, falls asleep, and he says to God, "Take my life." So there is a there is definitely a synergy here between the prophet succeeding and then the prophet falling into despair, which is curious. It's an interesting you into the psychology of the prophet Job. What's so weird about this too is that why why did Elijah go to just to uh, to just real? And um, what was the purpose of his doing that? Because he was facing uh, Jezebel. Right. Why did he go in front of Elijah? There's not that does not get explained. You're you're right. Make, yeah, it doesn't make sense why he would do that. Right. Suddenly an angel touched him and said, arise and eat. In other words, snap out of it, buddy. Go have something to eat, okay? He looked about there, and beside his head was cake baked on hot stone in a jar of water. So we're back to the miracle of nourishment. Same as it was with the widow. He ate and drank and laid down again. The angel of the Lord came to him a second time and touched him and said, arise and eat or the journey will be too much for you. He arose and ate and drank strength from the meal. He walked 40 days and 40 nights as far as the mountain of God, or which are his Sinai. <laughs> so I want to, and I'll just read the last sentence and we'll pick up here next time. There he went to a cave and there he spent the night. And here we're going to go in quite a bit of detail comparing him to Mount. Before I leave this whole metaphor of the water and the fire and the food and the eat and the drink and the revival of the dead and the slaughter of those, what do you make out of this mishmash? Make some water to this. So there are, so let's take a look at this. What are the elements here that we have to make some kind of theology out of? We have food, we have water to drink, right? We have water in the form of rain. We have fire, we have death, we have resurrection. We have the recognition, recognition. We have the recognition of the prophets, of the of the widow, of the birds, of the right cave. We know where to go, right? So what 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 is this section of Elijah trying to teach us about the nature of our lives? and the nature of our relationship to God. It's a very dramatic narrative. It has over and over again food appearing out of nowhere, water appearing out of nowhere, fire appearing out of nowhere. Talk to me about the elements here. These, all these elements and, and within the context of this story and with adequate recognition at the top reminds us of our responsibility to constantly be aware of that which is, is around us and not to see things at their surface but that underneath a person place or thing or element there's something else going on and if we walk by a bush that's burning we're going to miss out on a whole lot okay keep going <laughs> Yes. The world really cannot be understood and you cannot really live in the world. 
Keep going. What do you mean? Well, I mean, you look like you're going to starve, but God provides food, God provides water, bread. When you're faced with a crisis in faith, God proves his strength and the, the failure of people. Possibilities of God is without God, there is no love. So all the elements that we could actually add air here if we wanted to because of the breath of the child. So we could add air. So water, fire, and air. All the elements can make us live or make us die. And the, the missing link of whether the elements of the physical universe are life-sustaining or life-draining is God. Because otherwise, they're just elements. Fire is good and fire is bad. Water is good and water is bad. Air is good and <coughs> air can be bad, right? So the elements are just elements. What makes it sustainable, makes life sustainable, or what threatens life is not the elements themselves, but the creator of all things, the creator of the universe. And if you turn your back, not on the elements, but on the causation of the elements, the creator of the universe, and put your focus elsewhere on your own power, on any false god that you may want to say right now, on money, on your own power, on your own ego, on your own nobility, on a false god, then what you're doing is you're denying the creative force in the universe, which is really the source of the sustenance, the real source of nourishment. And all this hocus pocus and use of fire and water, the birds that bring the food, the bird, the, the, the resurrection, the water on the altar, the, the, the drought, the water coming back, the fire that comes up suddenly, or the fire that cooks the cakes that, that sustains him. All of this are metaphors to say your focus is in the wrong place. It is not the God of fire or the God of air. It is the one creator of the universe. Focus in the right place. Don't miss the point here of all of life. Because where is the power? The power is not in you. And yes, the power is in God. And yes, the power becomes even more powerful when it's in the faith that you and if you don't understand it and don't believe it, I'm going to tell you in a way that is so dramatic and so outlandish <coughs> and so filled with parable and metaphor that I'm going to have to get your attention. <laughs> is that why he doesn't confront Jezebel right away? Well, he and Jezebel are going to continue. They're, they're sort of exploits, and I mean, it's not over yet. It's not over yet. I think it's a, a partnership that we have with the Creator. It's not an equal partnership, but I mean, God can do all these things, but you know, the deal to the lottery figure he can't play. So God can create air, water, and fire, but we need to know when and how to use it appropriately. Okay, so here's this water. So I need to know to pour the water on and to, to save some. But even if we use the elements appropriately, they can still destroy. There can be a tsunami or a horrible fire. Or without them, you can't live. You can't live without the fire. You can't live without the water. That's why the insurance company calls it an act of God. The insurance company calls it an act of God. Yeah. That's why the mikvah can be such a powerful ritual, because you immerse yourself in the element in which you cannot live within or without. You can't live without water, you can't live within water. So when you immerse yourself three times, surrounded by a blessing, and it's got to be water from the heavens, it can't be tap water, you're acknowledging what Elijah is trying to teach us, that that, it, that life is fragile, and the sustainer or taker away of life is not you. And life becomes 
meaningful, meaningful if you live in that, in that, in the blessing of the fragility. Because you say the blessing when you immerse yourself. When you live in the blessing of the fragility. Because fragility is, vulnerability is actually a blessing. Thinking that you're almighty is actually a curse. We know that to be true in our own minds, and for sure Elijah is teaching us that. I really expect someone to comment after all this. Do you? <laughs> and I'll oh, leave it there. Thank I will you. leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs> See you next week.